and your host and oh yeah once you like this video once you subscribe to our channel and oh yeah the more subscribers you we get the, oh yeah we got a whole lot of good stuff coming at you and you're gonna love it the more you're gonna grow and once you ring that bell ding 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 that way you ain't missing things especially tonight you know there's a whole big list you know when we quote unquote fill out the wheel packages and all that we fill out the packages, you know, for who gets wood and the wheel and all that. You know, there's parents, there's gonna be the spouses, and the parents, and the eldest, and the middlest, the youngest, so forth. Right? Woo! Gonna dig a little deep into that, but we got a whole lot more about that tonight. So you might well take notes on this because tonight, here on Resonate Sound, um, here is McKenna Boone, our chapel pastor, standing by. But tonight, it's about three words. Keep your birthright. Kenna, it's all yours. Go get him. Let's go resonate. I'm honored to be in his house this morning. I'm honored to be behind his pulpit this morning. It has been a minute since I've been behind his pulpit, being able to uh, speak his word behind the pulpit, and I am excited to be here. Amen. There's no place I would rather be. Um, I give honor and glory to my pastor because, once again, I feel like it's been about a million years since I've been, da since I've been back here. Um, I have the privilege of teaching class every once in a while, but if you've never done that, that's completely different. Uh, I'm thankful for what that is teaching me, but there's just something about preaching his word behind his pulpit, behind my pastor's pulpit. I give him honor and I give him praise this morning. Okay, do you love your pastor this morning? Can we give him some honor in this house? Do you love Jesus this morning? Can we give him some honor in this house? Yeah, honor where honor is due. I praise both of them this morning. So the title of my sermon this morning is keep your birthright. And we're going to start off, if you would, stand for the reading of the word. We're going to start by reading some scripture this morning. We're going to be standing for a minute, but that's okay. We're going to read the gist of this story, the most important part of this story, in Genesis chapter 25, verses 20 through 34. Stand for the reading of the word this morning, not in honor of me, but in honor of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Verse 20 says, And Isaac was 40 years old, that's old, when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethanol, the sovereign of Pandaram, the sister of Laban, and the Syrian. That's cool. And 21 says, And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife. This is important because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him. And Rebecca, his wife, conceived. So Isaac had a need. He went to the Lord and said, God, you've made me a promise. And I'm believing that, God, you're going to fulfill that promise. And Rebecca did conceive a child. And the children struggled together within her. The children struggled together within her. That's all we really need to know before we go any further. That's important. They struggled within her womb. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. 23. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Twins are pretty cool, I think. And the first came out red all over 
like a hairy garment. That's good, right? That's how the Bible describes him. Yeah, that, that sounds real good. Red all over like a hairy garment. Yeah, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three score years old when she bare the now. Stop right there. Do y'all know how old three score years is? Anybody? 60 years old. That's old. That's old to be having some kids. I don't know. 60 years old when she bare them. Go ahead. And the, the boys grew. And Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man dwelling in the tents. And Isaac loved Esau, that's dad. He loved his boy Esau because he did eat of his vengeance. But Rebekah loved Jacob, that's mom. And Jacob sawed pottage and Esau came from the field and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me I pray thee with that same red pottage for I am faint. Therefore his name was called Edom, which means red. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up, and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. If you would, bow your heads. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you, Lord, for this message that you gave to me this morning, God. I believe, God, that you have a word to speak to your people, and I thank you for allowing me to be the vessel to do it, God. Every word that's spoken from my mouth to their ears, God, I'm asking to devour, take it if not, God, that you let your anointing begin to pour out in this place. God, that you would remove my flesh, God, help me to speak everything you would have me to speak and omit those that you would have me to leave out, God. I give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise in your sweet name, Jesus, we pray. Somebody shout amen in this house. Amen, amen, amen. So Jacob and Esau were twin brothers, born to Isaac, the son of Abraham. Yeah, nations to prosper, and Rebekah. And the Bible tells us when we read that scripture that they struggled within Rebekah's womb. That's a good sign, right? They're already fighting before they even come out. That's a, that's a bit of a, ooh, I'd be a little concerned. They struggle together in the womb. That's just telling us they're going to struggle a little bit outside the womb as well. That was just a foreshadow of what was to come between these two. But Esau was born first. Through all that struggling, Jacob actually had a hold of Esau's heel, trying to get out first. But nevertheless, Esau was the one who was born first. And with that, he became the legal heir to the family birthright. Now let me talk a minute about birthright. Birthright has to do with both position and inheritance. So by birthright, back in these old times, birthright, the firstborn son inherited the leadership of the family, but that wasn't enough. He also had the judicial authority of his father. But more than that, now catch this right here, the firstborn also gets to inherit twice as much as what all the other children get. That's pretty cool, you know what I'm saying? No wonder Jacob was trying to get out first. If you were first, you get a lot of good stuff, okay? So more on the story of Jacob and Esau. They had an awful, what I, we would call today a sibling rivalry. I don't have, anybody in here have siblings? Okay, I do not, so I don't know. The closest thing I got is my cousin Madison. And let me tell you, we did. We fought like sisters. We had, but I never had a real sibling to kind of fight between. But I, I've seen what goes on there. I've seen, you know, you just want to get ahead. You want to be the best one. You want to be mom and dad's favorites, right? Is that, is that true? Yeah, that's what these two had going. Except it, it was a little bit more severe. You know what I'm saying? They took it to the next level. But this was encouraged by Isaac and Rebecca. They kind of started it themselves. Genesis 25 and 28 
flat out tells us. Put that up there, Genesis 25, 28. It says, Isaac, that's dad, he loved Esau. Esau was his favorite because he was like him. But Rebecca loved Jacob. That's pretty problematic, I would think. If you have twin boys, dad has a favorite and mom has a favorite, they're going to constantly be competing to win both parents over. Right? Why am I not mom's favorite? What have I done that mom doesn't like me more? I need to be better so I can gain mom's trust so mom can love me. You know what I'm saying? That, that's real talk, right? So obviously they were going to fight. They were going to get into some trouble because their parents had favorites. That's to be expected. All right? Now we have Esau and we have Jacob. It tells us in the Bible that Esau's name means Harry. It's a little interesting. All right? But he's also referred to as Odom, which is said earlier in the scripture, meaning red. Those two things were very important to him. That's where he was named after. But Jacob's name, if you study that out, means deceiver. Imagine being named deceiver. You know, like you're just kind of doomed there. In Hebrew culture, we talked about how Jacob was grasping the heel of his brother as they were struggling in the womb because he wanted to get out first. He's trying to pull this dude back in so that he could get out. If you study that out in Hebrew culture, grasping the heel of another was a figurative way to express deception. So from the very beginning, before he was even birthed out, he was trying to deceive his brother. Before he was even born, he was trying to cause issues with his brother. That's crazy to me how that works. How crazy that he's holding on to it before they're even born. So if you dig a little more into their story, it goes a little something like this. Esau was coming home from the field and he was faint. He was tired, he was exhausted, and he was hungry. Anybody else come in from work every single day and they're tired, they're exhausted, and they're hungry? It's me. It's me. My mama used to tell me, I'm a teacher if y'all didn't know, my mama used to tell me when I was in high school, when I was in elementary school, I'd come home from school every day, I'll go straight to the snacks because I had to have a snack as soon as I got out of school. Well, now I'm a teacher in school every day and she always makes fun of me because I'm the exact same way. I come home, I'm exhausted, and I'm tired, and I need something to eat. That's exactly where Esau was. Tired, exhausted, and he needed something to eat. He was faint. So Esau said to Jacob, give me some of that stew. You made this pot, give me, give me some of it. I'm tired, I don't feel good, give me something to eat. He really even said that he was about to die. So knowing the state of his brother, Jacob, the deceiver, he's gonna wedge his way in here right now because that's who he is. Jacob replied, not doing what a good brother would do. He, here, I made this. Here, just go ahead and have some up so you don't die. No, 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 no. Jacob said, okay, but what you got to do for me is you got to sell me your birthright. Give everything you have, everything that's been promised to you in days to come, you have to give it to me in order for me to give you this. Jacob knew the importance of having a birth. It says Jacob drew tents. He, he was at home a lot. He got time to sit around and was able to think about how important it is to be the firstborn son. He knew the importance where Esau didn't. So what he did was he came from behind. He saw his brother at his most vulnerable state and he got what he wanted by using Esau's weakness. Now, doesn't that sound a little bit like my enemy? The enemy that comes against us, he catches us when we're vulnerable, he catches us when we're tired, when we're exhausted, when we're at our end, we don't know what to do, and we, he says, all right, let me sneak on in here real quick, because he's also a deceiver, he is the author of lies. He says, all right, let me sneak in here when they're at their worst state, and let me see if I can take what I really want. Huh. 
So Esau agreed. He said, I'm at the point that I just want to die. I'm just, I'm just going to die. I, I, I'm about to just, I, I'm famished. I have nothing left. I'm going to die. So what good is this birthright to me anyway? If I'm going to die, I won't ever live to see it come to pass. So what good is it? Now that's a little dramatic. That sounds like me. I'm about to die if you don't give me some food right now. I tell Tyler that all the time. I'm about, ah, I'm getting sick. I'm getting sick. It's dramatic. And that's exactly how Esau was. He was not going to die from missing one meal. He was not. Really, really, he was lazy if we want to get to the bottom of it. Let's call it what it is. He can go in the kitchen and make him up something himself. But he was trying to take from somebody else. And because of that, Jacob weasel his way in there. Now, that's also some of us. We're so lazy, we can't do nothing from ourselves. We're trying to ride pastor's coattail to heaven. We're trying to ride the associate. But hey, where y'all at? That's the truth. And then we're being a little dramatic. Oh, well, I'm just going to die. I'm just going to give it all up. I'm done with the ministry. I'm resigning. And we're just going to walk off. We're going to go to bed. We're going to cry a little bit because that's how we are. And that's when the enemy sneaks in and we allow him to because we are lazy and I can say that because I am 1000% I am me and the Lord have been battling with it for weeks and it cracks me up because I tell my students all the time I hand them their papers back and I said you got an awful score on this because you are lazy I do not reward laziness I tell them about that 30 times a week and that's exactly what the Lord says to me as soon as I get home put on my pajamas and sit on my couch he says, I don't reward laziness. And I said, Lord, what are, you, what are you talking about? He said, I'm talking to you like you're talking to them. And that's how we are. We want to condemn everybody else. We want to tell everybody else, you better get up. You better start doing something. But we're the ones who are just as lazy. And I say, well, Lord, I mean, I worked all day. God, this job is mentally exhausting, and it is. But he said, you have time to do that all day. You have time to sit there, scroll on your phone. You have time to sit there and do this, that, and that. Why don't you pick up a book and read? That's what he got. That's where he got me during revival. I praise God during revival because I knew, I knew I had been lazy. He smacked me upside the head and said, I've been lazy. And so that night, I laid that down, and I ain't picking it back up. And since then, I've been much better. <laughs> I'm done with the laziness. Some of us have to rise up and say, I'm done with the laziness. I'm ready to rise up. Before you can ever go to a new level, you have to leave your laziness behind because your laziness won't allow you to go. That's where I was at, and I've left it behind. But Esau, he was lazy. He said, this is much easier. You already got this fixed. Can I just have some of it? And Jacob was pretty smart. He's kind of like our enemy. Our enemy's pretty smart. I hate to say that. I'm not giving him any more power or anything like that. But he really ain't dumb because you allow everybody to know all of your business. And in doing that, the enemy knows every single bit of your business. You're giving him that open door. You're constantly complaining to everybody. You don't even know who in the world you're complaining to. And the enemy's right there saying, oh, okay, I know where to get them. And that's exactly what Esau did. He walked in and said, I'm about to die. I'm hungry. So Jacob said, all right, now I know what your weakness is. Let me use it. But he said, I'm at the point I'm about to die. If I die, what good will this birthright do? I'm not even going to live to see it. Dramatic. But that right there revealed how worthless he considered that birthright to be. It wasn't nothing to him. He said, okay then, just take it. And maybe it was because Esau was so overconfident that his life was going so good that the birthright didn't matter and nothing would really come against him. Maybe. But the fact of the matter was, Esau was hungry. He gave in for a moment. He so desperately wanted to fulfill the desires of his flesh that he gave up everything he had and even things that he had not even had yet, but things that he was promised in the days to come for his fleshly desire. Growing up, anytime I'd hear this story, I thought, this dude's a joke. These are the people, Jesus, you put these stories in the Bible, these, these guys are a bunch, couple of jokers. 
This man sells everything, gives up his whole lineage, everything that he is supposed to be, he just gives up for a bowl of stew. That's ignorant. And then once again, the Lord slaps me upside the head and says, so do you every single day. And I thought, Lord, I'm not that stupid. But that's how we are. No, it's not for a bowl of stew, but it is for our fleshly desires. Fear comes knocking and we say, okay, I give everything up and I'm going to follow this fear. I'm going to let fear corrupt me. I'm going to let fear take me down. Anxiety, depression, whatever it may be, it comes knocking at our door and we say, okay, here's everything I am. I'm just, I'm done. Have you ever been there? We do the same thing. As believers, we have an inheritance of a birthright through Jesus Christ, our God. Everything he has, he gave to us. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 14. I'm going to read the amplified version. It says, in him also we were made God's heritage and obtained an inheritance. For we had been foreordained, chosen, and appointed before him. Before he even knew us, he chose us in accordance with his purpose, who works out everything in agreement with the counsel and the design of his own will. Next verse. So that we who first hoped in Christ, who first put our confidence in him, have been destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory. In him, you also who have heard the word of truth, the glad tidings, gospel of your salvation, and have believed in and adhered to and relied on him, were stamped by the seal of the long-promised Holy Spirit. That spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance, the first fruits, the pledge, and the foretaste, the down payment on our heritage in anticipation of its full redemption, and are acquiring complete possession of it to the praise of his glory. What that means is you inherited the birthright to Christ. Everything he gave to us. And our inheritance involves several different many aspects, okay? We will inherit our salvation, obviously, the kingdom of God. It tells us we're going to inhabit the earth. We also have wealth and blessing stored up. So that's what the Bible tells us. That's the inheritance we get by just being a true disciple or a true child of God. Not someone who just shows up on Sundays to make mom and dad happy. Not somebody who does the bare minimum, but somebody who is truly sold out to God and is truly a disciple and a child of his. But if you allow your appetite for the things of this world to get so strong, you're gonna be tempted to give all that up for a moment of temporary happiness. You can't tell me that stew lasted him for a week or so. He was full, huh, some of these guys I know, my husband, my dad, all these folks, they eat, they'll be good for about, I don't know, three hours, and then they're hungry again. You know what I'm saying? So you can't tell me this stew did him anything, really. He gave everything up for just a little bit of happiness. And that's how we are. We give everything up for the pleasures of this world. We trade in our inheritance for a taste of the world's stew. And it just ain't even that good. It ain't worth giving everything up for. It might look good, and it might smell good. Don't allow it to take everything from you. Don't trade your inheritance because you are hungry for something. If you are hungry, you better run to Jesus because he has something for you that this world could never, ever give. He gives you a drink of that living water, you'll never thirst. He gives you some of that bread, and man, oh man, you will never grow hungry. But this world, it won't last you very long. It says in Genesis chapter 25, verse 34, it tells us that Esau despised, despised his birth. 
How many of us have been right there? We despise what the Lord has told us to do because it doesn't fit our agenda. It doesn't fit what we want to do. We don't think we're comfortable doing it. We think, oh, God, I could never do this. You are 1,000% right. You never could. But with him, if he has called you to do something, that's what he wants you to do. That's how we are. We despise it. Fear gets in the way. Our pride, that's a big one, gets in the way. We don't feel like we're good enough, and it gets in the way. And we then, we just despise, or we just don't pay any attention to what God has called us to do. Or the, and then we're missing out on our inheritance. Why would, why would we miss out on something so spectacular? Here's what I want. If you go on to finish this story, Jacob, I'm telling you, this guy's a trip. He also steals Esau's parental blessing. So basically, before the father dies, we know he took his birthright, but before the father dies, the father has to pass down his blessing, basically, onto the firstborn son for him to actually inherit everything. Okay? It involved the transfer of leadership over the family to the firstborn son. The blessing also served as a prophetic proclamation of how God would act on behalf of the individual and the family. So old dad, Isaac, he was on his deathbed. He was blind. He was um, just very ill. I mean, he can't really move, can't really do anything. He don't really know what's going on. He can't see. And all he wanted was to give that blessing to Esau. That's all that was left for him to do on this earth. But with the encouragement of his mother, with the encouragement of his mother, his mom told him to, love that, right? Jacob dressed up like Esau, got into character, sent Esau, they sent him on some random goose chase, had him running around somewhere doing something different. And then he shows up, Jacob shows up as Esau. And once again, Isaac is blind. Isaac has no idea what's going on. He's just ready to give his firstborn son his inheritance. But Jacob steals his father's blessing right out of Esau's hand. When Esau comes back and he figures it out, you can only imagine how mad he was. Um, but he was very mad. What he did was he threatened to murder his brother. So Jacob in that moment was pretty smart, and what he did was he ran out of there. Years pass. They don't talk. They don't see each other. They actually live two very different lives. And it doesn't tell us a lot about Esau, but Jacob goes through it. Jacob manipulated his brother, he deceived his brother, and what he reaped, he got sold right on back to him. He was manipulated, he was kind of ran about, given, I mean, he lived a not so great life for a while because of what he did to his brother. Plenty of things happened, but if we keep reading chapters and chapters later, Jacob begins the journey back to his home to meet his brother Esau. And when doing this, we see a massive shift in his personality. He's no longer selfish. He no longer has some hidden agenda to destroy his family, to destroy his brother. But as he prepares to meet his brother, Jacob prays in Genesis chapter 32, verses 10 through 11. He says, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and all the truth which thou hast showed over unto thy servant. For with my staff I have passed over this Jordan. Now I am become two bands. Next verse says, Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him. He knew he messed up. He knew he was in trouble. And he thought after all these years, Esau was going to get him. So protect me, lest he come and smite me and the mother with the children. So during these years, 
God completely transforms Jacob. And now suddenly he's a man with a repentant spirit and a concern for his family. The family that he almost betrayed just a few chapters earlier. He's trying to completely get rid of his brother doing his family dirty. But now God has completely transformed his spirit. And now he has a wife, he has children, and he's worried about his family. There's also growth with Esau. After the loss of his blessing, he threatened to kill his brother. That's fair enough, right? Siblings, is that, is that fair enough? Is that kind of how that would go if you had siblings? They took them. I'm going to kill you. That's where he was. And Jacob was right to feel scared about it because he did mess up. He knew he made a mistake, and he knew he was wrong. But now here is the most, one of the most beautiful things in the Bible. Perfect portrait of God's love and God's grace to us. Okay, I love this. When Esau approaches Jacob, when they finally meet back up together, you know, Jacob's like, ah, he's going to stab me. He, you know, he's watching his hands. My husband and my dad both tell me to study people all the time. you got to watch people. you got to watch people because you don't know what they're going to do. And so I just know Jacob's like staring every inch of him down. Like, where, is he throwing the right punch left to throw me off? What's he doing? You know that's how he is. But he, Esau wasn't interested in any of that. When Esau approaches Jacob, There's not a single bit of hate, not a single bit of resentment, no anger, no uh, no disappointment. There's nothing. Genesis 33 and 4 says Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. Scripture doesn't tell us what happened really in Esau's life over all those years, but it's safe to say that God completely transformed him as well, softened his heart, changed his whole outlook on life, and completely changed about how he felt about his brother. Things only God can do. Because if it wasn't God, you know he would still be mad. You know he's got the gun loaded in the back pocket. You know what I'm saying? But he didn't care. And that gets to me. I sit there and I was studying this story, and it gets to me. Because that's how God is with me. This story is a picture of what God offers me. This is me and God. A redeemed relationship that I could never buy, that I could never earn, that I could never deserve. But it's also something that we can never lose. Never. I have wronged God. I have made mistakes. I have fallen. I have been just like Jacob. I have stolen things from people, not physically. I have hurt people. I have done exactly what Jacob did ten times over to every single person that I know. And yet I see myself standing before God. I can just see. I'm holding my offering up to him and I say, God, I'm sorry. This is my way to try to make amends. God, I'm sorry. Here's my praise. Here's my worship. Here's everything. Here's my good deeds. Here's whatever you want, God. I give it all to you. Can this fix our relationship? But his response is telling me that he already has enough. He doesn't care about anything I've done, doesn't care about where I've been, doesn't care about any of it. He has enough for me. And not only does he have enough, but he is. That's me and God. And I know there's some people in here today that that's you and God. Some of us here today, we've made mistakes. We have let the enemy weasel his way in at our moment of weakness because there are times when we will be weak. And we let him weasel his way in. And we sell our birthright to him. 
And the sad thing is sometimes we don't even realize that we've done it. Because it's easy to do. It's a moment of weakness. And we completely get rid of the promises God has made for us. If, if it's not going fast enough, if it's not the way we want it to, if it's not, if it's not on the track that we're on, we think, oh no, God's forgot about me. I'm just as good as dead. What good is this birthright to me if I'm dead? We do exactly what Esau did, and we throw it away. Some of us here today might have had that moment of weakness. But today, Jesus is meeting us here. Just like Jacob and Esau, Jesus is meeting us here, and he's forgotten all about it. There's not a single bit of anger. There's not a single bit of resentment, a single bit of, you should have done better. I told you so. Why don't you listen? He's forgotten all about it. He just wants to embrace you. He just wants to kiss you, love on you, and say, just thank you for coming back. I'm just glad to have you home. It's very similar to the story of the prodigal son, which is my favorite story in the Bible. And I wish I could preach it every time I get behind the pulpit, but that's no good, right? So it reminds me of that story, though. Just to come home. No matter how far you've, you've wandered off, no matter how many mistakes that you've made, it, it doesn't matter to the father. It doesn't matter to your brother. It doesn't matter as long as you're home. So this morning, maybe we've been like Esau. Maybe, maybe we've sold some stuff away. Maybe we've known that we've done it, and you just feel too ashamed to ever or too scared like Jacob was to ever come back home to him. Or maybe you had no idea at all, and you just didn't know what to do. Hi, everyone. I'm Corbin Chris Heineken, the Dean of Arkansas Sportscasters and host of Rest Day Excel. I want to say a special thank you for listening to Amplify Jesus with us here today. No matter where you are, if you're joining us live here at Rest Day Church, whether you're joining us nationwide, courtesy of your local syndicated television stations across the country, or if you join us internationally and globally, courtesy of our YouTube simulcast. Thanks so much for resonating Jesus with us. Now, you ask it, and you say, corporate, you know, resonate. No, you guys always bless us, but we want to turn around and bless you through the act of worship called giving. How do we do it? Yes, we are. Multiple ways, form in particular, on which you can resonate your giving. Check it out. Number one, join us live and in person here at Resonate Church at a brand new location, 3702 East Highland Drive. It is directly across the street from All Star Music in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Sundays, 10 a.m. and 5 p.m., Wednesday nights at 6 30, and we do keep in mind, Things schedule subject to change. Option number two, online. That's a little tidly thing right there. Use the term Resonate Church AR. That's right. Everything right there on the screen. Resonate Church AR. If you want to resonate your giving online, just follow the directions and you can do that safely and securely. Option three, your cell phone. Look, we all got one. Might as well use it, shall we? What well, resident you're giving using your cell phone? All you gotta do, text the word give to that number right there on your screen. Safe, fast, secure, easy, simple to do. Option four, mail it. If you wanna mail your contribution to us, courtesy of a check or money order, please make all checks and money orders payable to Resident Church and send it to the address on your screen. Once again, want to resonate your giving courtesy of a mailing option. Send your check or money order. Make all checks and money orders payable to Resonate Church and send it to that address on your screen. And those are the ways you can resonate your giving. And remember, show love, your peace, and say Jesus. Wow. Even watch the air on the monitor, Kevin. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Hope you guys were taking notes. 
on this broadcast. You know, stop letting the enemy. You know, your enemy is not a human being. Your enemy is spiritual. And that spiritual enemy is like a roaring lion. Just coming to see who, can, who he can eat up. Stop letting the enemy steal your blessings. Stop letting the enemy take away the blessings that God's already blessed you with. Stop letting them take your birthright. That was granted, that was handed all the way down. From God himself to Adam. All the way through to the lineage of Jesus. With, along with the Holy Spirit all included. Stop letting the enemy take that birthright away from you. Instead, rise up against the enemy. In fact, start praising God. Because if the enemy is under your feet and wherever you put your feet, you can claim that ground. Guess what? You can get your birthright. And not only get your birthright, keep your birthright. And guess what? Hold it and secure that birthright. Because you know, it's all part of that spiritual insurance policy. It never runs out. And you don't have to pay for it. Because it's already been paid for. And there ain't no premium to it. You get every single benefit from it. Don't let the enemy take that away from you. Be smart. Stay clean. And keep your breath right. God, thank you so much. Rest of the day, Thank you all for watching. I ain't no service like a live rest of the day service because a live rest of the day service don't stop. Join us right here at Rest of the Day Church info on the screen. And four ways you can rest of the day. You're giving uh, Rest of the Day Church shows bro back. Calm has the other option. And all the pictures, do scoops, views, info, so much more. Facebook.com forward slash Rest of the Day Church shows bro. And you watch this program on YouTube, so like the video, subscribe to the channel, ring the bell, ding, 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 the way you ain't missing anything. And we got another good one for you. This Thursday night, please join us in prime time. Same time, same place right here on this same station. I'm Chris Honigan for our entire group. We say to you, show up, get in peace, you know it. Resonate Jesus. See you Thursday night at prime time, 9 p.m. Eastern, YouTube Worldwide, and 9 p.m. Eastern and Pacific on this station. Join us, Wigan. Good night, Canada. Good night, everyone. See you. Neither take